kind of church service already. I could go home. There was a prayer meeting before the service I found extremely moving. Then you get into the worship, then you see baptisms. I thought, we're done. We're done. Joel insisted, no, you get paid to do a job. Get up there. You're not going yet. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastoral team here at Harvest City. This is the fourth lesson in our sermon series titled, My Church. Pastor Joel led the first couple talking about my church, the church Jesus is building, being a people that's uh, creating a people who are, uh, have a victorious mindset, who know God as the God of the breakthrough. Last week, Anatoly stepped up, created a new English word for us, told us all about one anothering. I don't get to make up a word. I have been assigned a very specific word. It's not even a word in the Bible. What kind of preaching challenge is that? Let me give you two clues on the word for the morning. One of them involves a story of some counterfeiters. They were going to get rich by making fake money. The technology they were using got a little mashed together. It was supposed to create $100 bills, one zero zero. The zeros got off a bit and turned into an eight. So they had a whole wad of $18 bills. They knew there was a neighborhood not so far away where the people had a reputation as being a little bit simple. So they thought they'd take their fake, awful money to that neighborhood and try to fool somebody. They took a wad into the convenience store and said, hey, can you make change for an 18? And the guy at the till said, what do you want, two nines or three sixes? <laughs> that story's not quite as real as this story. A zoo in China recently made the news. You may have seen this story because people were a little suspicious that something in the panda exhibit looked a little bit off. Because the pandas looked like this. But run the next picture. These animals are not the same. It doesn't matter if you put black and white paint on one. It doesn't turn into the other. What's the word you were assigned, Jason? Stupidity? No. Nope. Authenticity. Which is a good word. It's worth the morning. In an age of quickly changing technology, AI and all its implications, I'm not even here this morning. This is a hologram. I'm on holiday. It's a very accurate hologram. But here he goes. Years back in a previous church, in a previous lifetime, I preached a series titled, What Jesus Hates About Religion. It's a little misleading in the title. Preachers do that to get your attention. Jesus doesn't entirely hate religion. In fact, he's not anti-religion. He functioned quite beautifully in a very religious setting. He participated in all sorts of religious practices. He was at the synagogue. He fasted. He prayed. He attended all the annual festivals. He visited the temple. If Jesus had an issue with religious systems or religious people, it typically revolved around a lack of authenticity. So that sermon series I had pulled out of Matthew 23, because Matthew 23 is a chapter where Jesus has plenty to say about fakes and fronts and facades. And facade is a word worth pausing with as well. A facade is a building that's not really a building. One time I went on a tour of a small movie studio. They drove us around grounds that didn't look very impressive in any way. And then we got to a certain point and they said, this is where such and such a movie was made. And I looked around and thought, no, it's not. I've seen such and such a movie. And this doesn't look anything like the place where it would have been. And then they said, no, look more carefully. Look at that wall. Look at that doorway. You remember their se that scene where that guy did that thing in that way? Put the camera here, and that's it. And I looked and thought, eh, okay, well, that's one example. But they continued to move me around this very small plot of ground, strategically showing me walls and angles and doorways and ledges where the whole movie had been constructed. It was quite disappointing. This grand world of my entertainment enjoyment had been captured in what was basically a back lot behind a warehouse. That's a facade. 
It requires very strategic angles, very calculated presentation. We have these discussions about social media all the time, right? That's where that lives, but is completely separated from what our spiritual lives are supposed to be like. There's to be no association with that type of fakery. Matthew 23, this chapter I've alluded to with this past sermon series, it's the place where Jesus uses the word hypocrites the most quickly. Six or seven times he piles it on top of each other. A hypocrite wasn't a religious word in Jesus' day. It was an entertainment word. He's using the word for actor. He's telling the people, you guys have all seen a presentation. You've seen that format where a single actor performs multiple roles and the only way he tells you who he is is by putting a different mask up in front of his face and acting out the scene. It happens at the theater. It's not supposed to happen in our life with Jesus. This is a drama thing, but it's not to be a discipleship thing. Matthew 23, that storyline gets presented in the Gospel of Luke as well. And when we read about it in Luke 12, these are some of the things Jesus has to say. He says, by this time, the crowd, unwieldy, stepping on each other's toes, the crowd numbered into thousands. But Jesus' primary concern was with his disciples and to them, so get that, there's a crowd of people, a bunch of eyeballs, Opinions you could try to influence. He's not concerned about the mass. To his disciples, in the midst of the mass, he says, watch yourselves carefully. That you don't get contaminated with Pharisee yeast, Pharisee phoniness. You can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip. Your true face will be known. You can't whisper one thing in private and then preach the other thing in public. The day is coming when those worshipers, when those whispers will be repeated all over town. Jesus isn't making a threat. He's not saying to his disciples, get your stuff together or I'm going to publicly out you and humiliate you. He's just pointing out what's real matters. And what's real lasts. And if it's not real, I don't know what we're doing. So the people of God do not aspire to be actors We don't waste energy on playing favorable angles or crafting shiny appearances. Of course, we wish to bring our best in every moment. But even there, the power lies in authenticity. And so I've got kind of three maybe turns of the jewel. If authenticity is a concept to hold up, maybe there's three angles that we could highlight this morning. The first one is this, that authenticity extends invitation. Some of this theme was getting prayed about in the back room. It's like someone had read my notes. If, if someone with certain experience of church or religion thought we were talk, heard we were talking about authenticity this morning, they would wonder how we had the nerve. There are many, maybe in the room, who have sampled religion in such a way, with such a flavor, with such a a veneer, that to speak of authenticity and religion in the same breath sounds like a joke. Many have had a taste of religion that would say, it is disconnected from real life, it seems fake, distant, and irrelevant. Authentic? I have no idea what you're talking about, Jason. Some of us have had the good fortune of living within Christian communities that have aspired, though, to authenticity. What a difference it makes, particularly if you've had a taste of that first one and then a taste of a second one. In churches through my life, I have taken such a joy when someone with some of that religious baggage has stepped into a place where authenticity was a value and priority and has then said something like, oh, this feels nice. This feels real. I, could, I need this. Other people need this. Or one of my favorite sentences is when they say something like, this just feels like home. Amen. Home is such a good word. How many worship songs do we have with the word vagabond in it? <laughs> I don't think there's many. I know one. What's a vagabond? <laughs> Guy without a home. Someone who wanders looking for a place where they fit, but they don't seem to find it, so they just keep moving. 
What would it look like if you were shopping for a church where authenticity was a value? In the very shallowest end of the pool, if I was hunting for a church where authenticity was a value, I'd probably start Googling. I'd hope that the website gave me images or language that made me suspect, hey, maybe I could fit there. I'd probably show up at a Sunday assembly trying to get a feel of the vibe of the place, see how the people talk, see how the people act, wonder if it's genuine or if I should dive in a little bit deeper or back up and head somewhere else. I'd probably listen to the worship songs, see if they were expressing things that I could express or even expressing things that I wished I could express. I'd probably listen to the preacher. If he had a bunch of stories in which he was always the hero, I'd probably head elsewhere. If he had a bunch of stories where he was like a little girl hiding behind a door in his house, I'd probably show up one more time. <laughs> if, I, if I came in the room and the sign I saw at the front said, live your call, I might dare to imagine they are suggesting that my life doesn't need to be the same as their life, that my call doesn't need to be the same as their call, that all of us actually are very unique people who could authentically walk with Jesus and have him do a unique and personalized work in our lives. That's a place I might call home. Home is a tricky thing. You can live in a way that you don't even feel at home with yourself sometimes. I can remember a younger version of Jason praying frustrated prayers where I would often express things to, to the Lord like, God, I'm sorry I'm as human as I am. I don't even like it. I'm imagining you must be even more frustrated. I don't feel as wise as I wish, strong as I wish, pure as I wish, brave as I wish. I wish I was more faithful. I wish I was better in 10 different ways, Lord. I didn't even feel at home in myself. I was bothered by what I was. I was bothered by what I wasn't. I was reminded that the word human comes from the word humus, which is the word dirt. Psalm 103 was a favorite sentence. For the Lord knows how we're formed. He knows that we are dust. That's one of the key challenges to authenticity. That when we strip off all of our layers, none of us are as impressive as we wish we were. So there's a truth here, but it's not a complete truth. Yes, we are people of dust, but we are not only people of dust. We are people of dust enlivened by the Holy Spirit. And God seems to take delight in that recipe. Dust people, Spirit of God, what a beautiful thing I'm about to make. And it's filled with authenticity. God doesn't begrudge us our most authentic, dust-level forms of humanity. In fact, he's very, very gracious. Psalm 103, which I read you one line from. If we stretch our text, it looks like this. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He knows how we're formed. He was there. He remembers that we're dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in a field. The wind blows over and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. God takes an unusual pleasure in us. The creation story has day after day of him working and saying, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he crafts the dust man and breathes his spirit in and says, this is very good. There is a certain glory that rests on humanity. It is complete nonsense to my brain. But there is a certain glory that rests on us. We may struggle to believe it. We may struggle to feel it within ourselves because we know our frailty and our fickleness and our failure. But in Jesus, God joins us. And in God joining us, there's a certain kind of bestowing of honor that he puts upon us. The story of Zacchaeus is a bit of an unusual example. Zacchaeus is the local tax collector. He is the scum of his community. He rips off the Jews 
and lives way too cozy with the Romans. Not Roman enough to fit there, not Jewish enough to fit there. Everybody hates him. And he uses both sides to his advantage. Not a lot of friends. Zacchaeus has heard rumblings of Jesus and the type of teacher he seems to be. He knows he's coming by. He finds a perch in a tree because he's a small man hoping to see this fellow that everyone's talking about. Jesus shocks him and the crowd by calling him out by name and saying, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. In that little moment, Jesus actually enters the dishonor of Zacchaeus, even takes some of it on himself. The murmurings begin. He's going to the house of a sinner. If this man knew who this guy was. Jesus takes on some of the dishonor of Zacchaeus, and in the act of entering his home, he puts some of his own honor onto him. It's a bizarre twist. Zacchaeus is the host in the story, but Jesus is the one helping him find a sense of home. The incarnation, Jesus coming in the flesh, is this little story stretched across the world and the universe now. Are we fallen? Yes. Are we fragmented? Oh, yes. Are we a work in progress? Can I get an amen? Is the one beside you a bigger work in progress? Uh, That's a bigger amen. (laughs) Whoever you are today, wherever you are today, Jesus is quite honoring of it. He is not unnerved. He is quite at home with you. And he meets you wherever you are, however you are. He meets you in a way that even if you've never felt a sense of home, he's telling you, come beside me. It'll feel like that. Because that's what Jesus extends to us. And when he extends it to us and we get any taste of it, then we find ourselves thinking, this would be a great thing to extend to the ones around me. When one life feels that touch, then a whole church gets generated where we become that type of place where when people step into our circle, that's what they feel. There's a quote by a fellow named Parker Palmer. He's been a lifelong educator. He's a a Quaker in faith heritage. But I've thought about this quote for years. He's talking about the soul and the way that the deepest part of us gets known, even to ourselves. And he says, the soul's like a wild animal. It's tough, resilient, savvy, self-sufficient, exceedingly shy. If we want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is go crashing through the woods, shouting for the creature to come out. But if we're willing to walk quietly into the woods, sit silently for an hour or two, the creature we're waiting for might well emerge. And out of the corner of our eye, we'll catch a glimpse of the precious wildness we seek. What's he saying? He's saying that an environment of authenticity is crucial because it creates that safe space. And if you've ever moved into a space that felt so safe that the real you could come out, then you have felt the benefit and blessing of it. And if you've ever felt it, then you should feel my next sentence that says, within church as we know it, Harvest City Church, every one of us has a hand in creating, nurturing, protecting that type of environment so the souls of people come out when they step into the room. Nurturing authenticity isn't rocket science, but it does take a wise, delicate touch. Some of it's just in how we listen to other people. How many parents pointed out to us that we had two ears and one mouth and we should do the math? (laughs) James chapter 1 has one of my favorite verses where it says that we should be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to become angry, for the anger of man never achieves the righteousness of God. Catherine Doherty is a wise saint from the past. She said, with the gift of listening comes the gift of healing. Maybe you've been on the receiving end and it's driven you to try to frequently be on the giving end. Curiosity is a second word that seems key. Some of these could be up on the screen if that slide's ready. I've had multiple people in the last few months tell me, Jason, always bend toward being curious rather than being critical. 
That's a handy little tip. Because whenever I come upon someone who's a very different creature than me, critical is kind of brewing in the back room. I do well to get curious rather than critical. It makes me ask more questions than giving statements. Curiosity expresses authenticity because it acknowledges, hey, we're all on a journey. We're all in a process. None of us are finished yet. I should do some learning. Confession might even be a third touch. That's a tougher one. Certain church circles are very at home with it. Certain ones, not so much. James 5 tells us that if we confess our sins to one another, pray for each other, healing can happen. It takes the right place. It takes the right company. But there's something there. These are simple moves, and there are an endless list of them. I couldn't possibly name them all this morning. But my point is that authenticity extends invitation, and every one of us can help the invitation happen. So that's number one. Authenticity extends invitation. Number two, authenticity creates connection. I have three daughters, almost all teenagers, Old enough to think that they can introduce their old father to things he's never heard of before. They're not wrong. But my, one of the younger ones came to me this week and she had a playlist on her phone of music. I don't know where she heard it or how she gathered it. But she asked if she could be the DJ on one of our drives. And so she played me some music. She introduced this song to me. It was a woman's voice, a very light, airy kind of voice. Some folksy girl singing in her basement. And she sang these lyrics, and my daughter thought they were amazing. Here were the lyrics. And I don't want the world to see me, because I don't think that they'd understand. When everything's made to be broken, I just want you to know who I am. And in my head, I thought, child, you don't know that all the good music was invented in the 80s and 90s before you were even here. (laughs) And some people in the room are correcting me. It was all in the 60s and the 70s when you weren't even here, Jason. (laughs) But whatever the case, my daughter had no idea that her new treasure of a song was from the Goo Goo Dolls in the 90s. And whoever wrote it and sang it, It names the challenge of authenticity, doesn't it? That we all want to be deeply known, and we're all not sure if we want to be deeply known at the same time. Sometimes when people talk about authenticity, they'll pull a surprising scripture from the pages of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 6 has this verse. It's a bit of a gem. Jeremiah 6 says this, From the least to the greatest, this is God talking, From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all are practicing deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. God is critiquing the prophets of the day, telling them they're false prophets, challenging Jeremiah, you will be the one who speaks truth. When things are hard, speak truth. When things are not how we wish they were, speak truth. In discussions of authenticity, this is important because authenticity involves truthfulness. We're not trying to fake it. We're not trying to be out of touch with reality. On the other side, we're not sharing every detail of our lives with every soul we meet. We're using wisdom. But we recognize that authentic connection hangs on authentic sharing. And it's especially true when things aren't as peachy or peaceful as we wish they were. Those are important moments for important forms of sharing. Masks. We linked that word to the description of hypocrites and actors and production. Masks are a tricky thing. In our honest assessment, all of us know, yeah, there's times when I probably mask up a little bit to present myself to people in a certain way. It's somewhat natural for life on planet Earth. We probably use a mask that we hope is somewhat admirable, enjoyable, I hope that when I put my little mask on that people might admire me or love me or appreciate me. Sometimes it even works. But when it works, now I have a problem. Because now we've connected. But they haven't connected with me. They've connected with my mask. 
And so now I'm really thankful that they feel a connection, but I'm in a bit of a bind. How do I navigate the next step? Years back, I was looking for a way to connect with some of the men in my life. And so I got into this format of annual practice where about a half dozen men and I would sort of link ourselves to each other. We had a very kind of agreed upon format. We would read books about various facets of being a man, a husband, a father, a follower of Jesus. We would discuss things every month together for a year. We'd meet together one-on-one, we'd meet together in our group, we'd have memory verses, we'd live as openly as we knew how alongside each other. And that was always the key piece. We'd start the year off by telling our stories as unvarnished as possible to one another. I was frequently the leader. I had to go first. I had to set the tone. Never that fun. Always well worth it. And I would share mine And the other men would match whatever bar I set. And by the end of a weekend together, we'd look at each other with unusual understanding and connection. C.S. Lewis talked about friendship. Friendship can be kind of a bland word, but not when you think of it like this. He said, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one. C.S. Lewis is describing a kingdom moment. That's not just a social moment. That's a kingdom of God moment. There are multiple miracles happening in the moment he's naming. That is a moment when isolation gets disempowered. Discouragement can lose its grip on somebody. There's hope that arises. Possibilities start peeking around the corners that you didn't know were there. And how does it happen? What sets up the miracle moment? Authenticity. Someone takes off a mask. Someone expresses vulnerability. Somebody voices a doubt or confesses a weakness or seeks forgiveness. And all of a sudden, the kingdom's crashing in. Maybe a month or two ago, Anatoly shared a quote in one of his sermons. It's been in my mind ever since. It was a Timothy Keller quote where he says, To be loved but not known, that's comforting, but it is superficial. To be known and then not loved, that's our greatest fear. But to be fully known and then truly loved, well, that's a lot like being loved by God. And it is what we need more than anything. And the thing that we need more than anything, the thing that the ones around you need more than anything, it starts with authenticity. And that's a thing that every single one of us, whether you've been in Harvest City for 50 years or whether you just showed up last week, this is something that all of us get to lend our hand to. We get to create and nurture that atmosphere in our church. Authenticity extends invitation. It creates connection. What else does it do? A third thing, it catalyzes transformation. It helps it happen. In Isaiah 40, there's a well-known passage about a voice crying out, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley raised up, every mountain made low, the rough ground level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and people will see it all together, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Of course, this passage gets pulled into the New Testament talking about John the Baptist. The basic point is there's preparation. You can do some work. God is coming. God's going to do something. You can help it happen smoothly and completely. The curious part of it to me is the wilderness mention. Why is that where the voice is crying out or the place where the preparation is done? The Bible is full of wilderness language. It is one of the grand metaphors of the scriptures. Maybe that comes with Israel being kind of a deserty nation. If the Bible had been written in the islands of the ocean, maybe we'd have different imagery. But the wilderness for Israel is profound. It's a realm of struggle, a realm of challenge. It's a landscape that swallows you right up, makes you feel very tiny and very weak. It often brings us to the end of ourselves It's a place that can feel like defeat. The wilderness is an environment where we often feel like we're tested, and lo and behold, we didn't test as well as we hoped we would. 
The wilderness can be a place of sighing and crying and even dying. But in that place, Isaiah and then John the Baptist are showing us even in that type of place, there's an act that we can undertake which leads to helping the work of God move forward unimpeded. And I would suggest that even in the worst broken spots, this is our act, to live with honesty, with honor, with authenticity. Authenticity has the power to break down barriers so that the work of God flows like water. It has the power to pave the path so that God moves on. It happens in your life as you do it. It happens in the lives of the ones beside you as you do it. Authenticity prepares the way of the Lord. For a lot of people in churches and out of churches these days, maybe Brené Brown is one of those voices who has led people to think about authenticity in a new way. She's got a million quotes on the topic, but here's one. That authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's the choice to show up, to be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. I have two memories that come to mind from the last six months of my life. Two different conversations. In one of them, I was visiting with a friend that I have growing mileage with. I would claim her as a dear friend. I admire her. I enjoy her in lots of ways. Her life is filled with plenty of challenges. Some of them are wildly heavy when I think about them. There have been moments of being very discouraged, disheartened, even feeling a sense of despair. Here I was trying to be helpful to the thing. I felt self-conscious because as I listened, I had no wise problem-solving words coming to my mind. I had no offers that I thought, if I just did this favor, everything would get better. I was battling weeks one and two. Joel, my victorious mindset, my faith in the God of the breakthrough, I was slipping. I asked questions, the most caring questions I could think of. I listened as well as I knew how. I just personally felt the weight myself. We sat together in a room with an unusual level of quiet. Many people in my life would have been unnerved. But somehow it felt like exactly the right thing. So I didn't move. I hardly breathed. Tear trickled down my cheek. Tear trickled down hers. We just looked at each other. Do you know how unusual it is for two human beings to hold each other's gaze for more than a second or two? But we were just there. And we cried. And we prayed. We amened and opened our eyes and just stayed in the moment a little bit longer. And life went on, and life sped up, and the volume turned up, and I moved on, and months passed by, and when I was chatting with her not so long ago, she brought it up. I had actually forgotten it. Life had moved along, and she said, do you know that that was a very holy moment? And I couldn't disagree at all. More recently, I had another person approach me. I had extended a bit of an invitation and said, if you ever need a voice, a set of ears, a sounding board, I could be that. She dared to take me up on it. Came to visit at my office. She said, I'm just, I have so many good things in my life. And it is so hard at the same time. I'm doing my best and I just feel like it's not good enough on multiple fronts all at the same time. I'm feeling a sense of disappointment with myself. Is God feeling it even more? She felt cautious because she said, based on my role, based on my position, based on my reputation and my relationships, do I have any place where I get to speak freely? Do I have any space that is 100% safe? And I dared to suggest, I think this room. I think me. And so she started. The wild creature, the soul, came out of the bush, slowly showing itself. She voiced questions out loud she only had, had only asked in her mind. She spoke of weariness. She described fears. I had, again, had zero wisdom to offer. Questions 
listening, understanding. She said she left feeling significantly lighter, and if anything happened that was wise at all, it was the inclusion of Psalm 139 into our discussion, where I urged her to say, you know what, I think the best you can do here is just live as openly before the Lord as you know how. Search me, God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. I fantasize sometimes that I get to discover authenticity and private safety with the Lord. And then when I discover it there, then I get to maybe somehow share it with you. But he nudges me in those visits and says, I don't work it that way, Jason. It's the other way. You want authenticity with me? You're going to grind it out with your brothers and sisters. Create safe spaces for one another. Bear some soul to one another. Offer forgiveness. Issue confession. Share the heavy load. As you find your souls finding safety with each other, you'll come back to me and you'll know some things you didn't know the first time. We are one of the gifts he gives so that we learn anything about this. A final text, and we'll wind it down. In John chapter 1, there's a curious story. Jesus is starting to gather his disciples. Some of them are the big names we know, Simon and Andrew and James and John. Philip gets in there. He followed John the Baptist, but now he's been redirected to Jesus. He's thrilled about it. We found the Messiah. He goes to find Nathanael and says, we found him. He's the one. Who is he? Jesus of Nazareth. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. And so he meets Jesus, and Jesus says, Nathanael, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. It's a word of authenticity. Here's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit, there's no guile, there's no treachery. Somehow the word lands. Nathaniel's shocked. How do you know me? How did you see me? How do do you know any of this stuff? There are many questions in that text. You have a clear sense that we're missing some details. But Nathaniel is amazed and Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Maybe he saw him in a private moment when Nathaniel thought he was just with the Lord and Jesus is saying, I was there. And that's the impressive piece. Whatever grabbed Nathaniel, that response from Jesus made him say, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus almost with a laugh says, if that impressed you, you're going to see greater things than that. Jesus nailed something, but his curious sentence is worth a pause. Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit, deceit, guile. It is literally like bait on a fishing hook for catching, for tricking, for playing games to your benefit. It's used in the Old Testament explicitly of one character, Jacob, the trickster himself. With that in mind, let's put a couple dots together. Jacob's the fellow who gets a new name, which turns out to be Israel. So here's Jesus with a very strange sentence, essentially saying, here is an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. What does he mean? It's as if he's suggesting, I know it is in your DNA. You have an ongoing temptation to mask, to hide, to play strange games, to paint extra layers for your own protection. Collectively, it happened in the Garden of Eden. Personally, we all had early life experiences that put us into game mode to hide our real selves. Jesus sees in Nathaniel something that nobody else could see. Nathaniel feels seen, feels known, feels safe. His soul crawls out of the bushes. This amazes him, makes him want to follow Jesus all the days of his life. And Jesus promises, if you stick with me, you will see even greater things than this. Because that's the power of authenticity. It extends invitation. It creates connection. It catalyzes transformation. It prompts Jason to ask the congregation to stand so he can pray for them.
This lesson could have hit you any number of ways today. If it's hit in any way that registers, that you think that's not one I should rush out of, come forward later. There'll be people who wish to pray. That corner will be a safe spot off a side. I'll be here. Pastor Joel will be here. We have multiple members of prayer teams and prophetic teams who will watch. If there are things to pray for relevant to this sermon or otherwise, can we agree? This space is safe. Do not leave feeling alone, hiding in the bush. But for all of us, let me pray for you. Lord, you saw Nathaniel, and you see us. And so let us know the safety of your gaze. Let everyone in this room, everyone watching online, let them sense firsthand the honor and the love with which you regard them. Let that experience plant in us seeds that feel like security, that feel like freedom. Let it draw us closer so that with Nathaniel we hear a preview of everything that will happen if we follow you, that we will see even greater things than being deeply known by you. Thank you for the power of authenticity, Lord, that this is something within reach for all of us and that as we live this way, we can extend invitation to others. We can create connection with the ones around us. We can catalyze transformation, preparing the way of the Lord. Give us wisdom, grace on how to cultivate this, how to protect this, how to nourish this in our church and in all the circles where we have influence. Be the healer of things like fear, shame, disappointment, hurt. In the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, bring down barriers that would drive us to live small, hidden lives disconnected from you or others. Share with us your peace as we open ourselves to you and to others. As the scriptures lead us, Lord, let this be our prayer this morning. Search us. Oh God, know our hearts, try us, know our thoughts, see if there is any grievous way in us, and then lead us in the way everlasting. Thank you, Lord, that you have sought out every one of us. You do not intend us to live homeless. Our home is with you. And it's alongside our brothers and sisters. And so we come in trust and receiving that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks to those viewing from online. We hope you're blessed. As I say, if there's things to pray about, don't leave. Otherwise, enjoy the company of brothers and sisters. Bless you, friends. Well, that brings us to the end of our time together. We hope that you found insight and had moments that spoke to you right where you needed it. Before you go, share the love and post this inspiring video to your page. Who knows how many lives could be impacted by it. And if you aren't already, like, follow, and turn on your social media notifications to keep up to date on all the exciting things happening at our church. Here at Harvest City, we're all about connecting with our community and celebrating those big moments. Like if you've recently decided to fully dedicate your life to Jesus, we'll be your cheerleaders and help you take those first steps. And if you're going through a tough season, let us know how we can help you. Plus, we've got tons of programs for kids, youth, and adults if you're looking for a new community to be part of. To send us a message or check out more about HCC, head over to our website, harvestcity.ca. To all of our financial partners, thank you for investing into the kingdom of God. Your generosity allows us to keep doing what we're called to do and reach even more people. If you're interested in contributing, please visit harvestcity.ca slash giving for more info. Thanks for being here. Keep living your call and we'll catch you again soon.